This is problem number 29 out of chapter 8. It says a small 650 gram ball on the end of a thin light rod is rotated on a in a horizontal circle of radius 1.2 meters. Calculate the moment of inertia of the ball about the center of the circle and B, the torque needed to keep the ball rotating at a constant angular velocity if air resistance exerts a force of 0 0.020 newtons on the ball. Ignore the rod's moment of inertia and air resistance um, on the rod, of course, because we have to include it for the ball. This question is, is potentially a little bit tricky because we have to deal with what is a point mass. The ball on the end of this rod is not rotating with an axis of uh, rotation through the ball itself. Its mass is located far away from this axis of rotation. So in order to solve this problem, at least for part A, um, what we're going to do is we're just going to treat it as a point mass. So we're going to have uh, I is equal to MR squared, where the mass of the ball was given to us in the problem as 650 grams, or 0 0.650 kilograms. And we know that the distance from the axis of rotation is 1.2 meters, and we have to remember to square that. When we, get, uh, when we crank that through the calculator, we get 0 0.94 and the units um, are kilogram meters squared uh, for part A. Part B is a little trickier because it asks about, um, you know, if we want to keep the ball rotating at a constant, constant angular velocity, uh, what's the torque needed to, uh, in order to, to kind of, in, in order for that to happen? Well, we should recognize that the net torque for something that's moving with a constant angular velocity is going to be equal to zero. And so therefore, um, the sum of the, the torques acting is going to be zero. So there is a frictional torque, a uh, you know torque due to air resistance on this ball. So if the object is kind of moving in a horizontal circle, then uh, friction is opposing that. And that frictional force that I've drawn in in red creates a frictional torque. So I can say that the torque due to this air friction is equal to the frictional force I'm going to add a uh, subscript of FR next to that uh, to describe that specifically that's frictional force times the lever arm distance D times the trigon trigonometric component uh, sine theta. This is our standard torque equation. So we can see then that, um, that there is a, a frictional torque that's generated. And therefore, we can say that the applied torque must be equal to that. So the applied torque, if that were positive, um, must be equal and opposite to the frictional torque. Now, technically speaking, it would be the applied uh, torque minus the frictional torque is equal to zero. And therefore, I can say if I add the frictional torque to both sides, that the applied torque is equal to the frictional torque. Um, and so now I'm ready to kind of substitute this in for uh, the frictional torque. And so I can say, well, the applied torque, in order to move it at a constant velocity, needs to be frictional force times the lever arm distance d times the sine, and this is going to be 90 degrees. The reason that it's a sine of 90 is that the force um, is acting perpendicular to the lever arm. So as that, you know, if I were looking at a top view of this thing, uh, if this is uh, the lever arm, uh, the frictional force would be acting backward, and this uh, this here would be our distance d to the axis of rotation. So this angle here is 90 degrees, and that's basically just going to uh, become the number one. So you know we can't always ignore it, but in this case, it doesn't affect our results. And so now we can say that the required applied torque is going to be this very small um, frictional force, which is 0 0.020 newtons times our distance of 1.2 meters. And when we get, uh, when we multiply those two things um, together, we get 2.4 times 10 to the minus second, or uh, 0 0.024 uh, newton meters or meter newtons, however you want to write uh, the torque units. So there's our answer to part B, and our answer to part A is up here. If this problem had asked um, us to include the moment of inertia of the um, of the rod here, um, then we'd have to do something a little different. It didn't ask us this, by the way. I'm just saying. Well, what if they told us, you know, the the mass of the rod? Then that would change what's going on here. 
we wouldn't say that the moment of inertia is just a point mass. We'd say that the total mo moment of inertia of the system was the moment of inertia of the point mass, the ball on the end, plus the moment of inertia of uh, the rod itself, where I was, was calling the ball on the end object number one and the rod object number two. So this would just become mr squared of the ball, which we already figured was 0.94 kilogram meter squared, plus, and then we'd go here and identify that we'd use the rod about the end, and that would become one-third the mass of the rod times the length of the rod squared. And so I'm just saying that hypothetically, if we weren't ignoring the mass of the rod, we'd have to include it in our total moment of inertia.